All right. Would you like some honey with that? Thank you very much. And thank you for being here after the lunch break. I hope you left a little bit of space in your tummy for just a little bit of honey. And probably some of you will be very sick after that um, and don't want to hear the word honey at all for quite some time. So who am I? Just very briefly, I work as a security engineer at a company in Germany called Datev. We are doing mainly software for tax consultants. So if you've never heard about us and you're living in Germany, chances that actually um, your statement at the end of the month was printed by us are really good. A short disclaimer that I need to say my, view, my views are my own. And whenever I'm using examples, I'm not really saying they are good or especially bad. They're just examples. And another short disclaimer, because we had that earlier, um, security are honey things generally security through obscurity. And security through obscurity, as many people will say, me included, is no security at all, at least not in my opinion. But in the case of honey stuff, it really works better the fewer people know about it. So you're not really basing your whole security infrastructure on honey stuff, at least I'm hoping you're not. So it's just an additional form of an early warning system, and as such, not really security through obscurity. In my opinion. Or, as we could put it, first rule of honey stuff, you don't talk about honey stuff, <laughs> which is kind of not what I'm doing here, but I'm talking about this stuff. Before we get to the more <laughs> esoteric things, we have to look at the traditional honey pots. <coughs> they really look like a vulnerable server at first, and it can easily become obvious at a second glance that's not what I signed up for, or that's not a real server. But by then it's too late because you already glanced at it or you already had contact with the honeypot. Traditional honeypots come in various stages, like from low interaction to high interaction. And a low interaction honeypot probably just uses an IP address on your network. And you can ping it, you can connect to it, sort of. It supports the services up to OC layer 4. And once set up, and running, they do not require a lot of maintenance. These are honeypots that are not advertised on your network, so um, there's no legitimate service on them. So whoever connects to a honeypot actually is considered to be an attacker because there's just no, ser not, no service running there. Medium interaction honeypots take it to a slightly higher level because they will simulate services like FTP or Telnet, and they also will allow an attacker to connect to those honeypots and leave their credentials that they wanted to use, and maybe look at the files the attacker wanted to have. And they are a little bit more maintenance because you have to look at them. Um, and you can put a high interaction honeypot on your network. Very often, these are machines that are connected to your backend. So a high interaction honeypot, just think about it as a really heavily monitored machine. They really try to find out what the attacker is going to do. But the attacker that connects to that machine uh, won't really be content with a cat picture. They want the real stuff. So you have to connect it to your databases so they get some real data. As you can probably see, these require a lot of maintenance and monitoring. And this means that high interaction honeypots are for very special cases. There are honey nets as well, and I'm briefly touching on onto them just in a minute. But all those honeypots have one thing in common. Once you connect, uh, you already triggered an alert. And this goes so far that uh, when talking to, to another machine on the network, I, the first thing that I need is the MAC address of the machine. So this <coughs> connection typically comes from the switch, if it's a segmented network. But this will trigger an alert already, because the machine the honeypot really sits in the network doing nothing. It's kind of like what we want to do when we monitor those things, do nothing. And before I come to the honey nets, why is honey stuff important or why do I think honey stuff is important? So detection is the new protection is something um, you might have heard. Uh, the funny thing is that companies and enterprises are really, really good at protecting the perimeter because that's what they have been doing for years and years and years. But the funny question is, 
where the heck is my perimeter nowadays? Because people bring their own devices that connect to the network. I've got cloud services that deal with my data. I've got partnering with others. And so to define where the perimeter is can actually be a daunting task. So it's easier actually to, well, easier, and it's not easier, and, and bosses do not like to hear that. Um, you should really assume that you have been breached and you want to detect that stuff. And honeypots or honey stuff is one method of doing that. And I really need to stress that no honeypot or honey stuff at all will prevent an attacker from attacking you, but you will know about it in, instead of having, of, of knowing about an attack a year after it has happened, you might get intel about the attack while it is happening. And that is, can be very important. So the first stage that an attacker does usually is when they have a foothold in your network, they will try to spread out without a lot of noise. So the group, uh, if you're on Twitter, you probably are familiar with him, uh, said, and many other people have said that as well, you only need one exploit, and once you're in, you move laterally. So whenever one machine <coughs> is breached and you're trying to find out more interesting machines to attack, there's one problem in modern networks. If you've got a really nice segmented network, you've got the friendly internet here, because I basically got sick of the red internet that is evil, so I made it a little nicey internet. And you've got different network zones, like um, the orange, the green, the blue, and you've got seg segments, you've got firewalls, the firewall also has an IDS IPS, and the reason why I combined those two is because most major vendors will do that. When Cisco bought SourceFire, they put the whole SourceFire intelligence on the ASA, so you probably will look at the network traffic whenever it crosses <coughs> network boundaries, like from orange to green or green to blue. But what you usually won't see is if somebody managed to breach your first firewall or whatever, and is, has compromised that machine, and is sitting on this machine, and is just spreading out without touching network borders. How big are the chances that you, that you will miss the connection from the internet to the server? And I would like to say very high, because you didn't notice that this machine got exploited. So it's easy for an attacker to pile out. If you've got honeypots and they get touched, then of course you get an alert and you know there's somebody there. A very brief excursion to honeynets. I've put some links in the links slide. Yeah. Um, about Waterworks and a train. These are two projects that really took the concept of honeypots to another level because they built whole networks and a fake waterworks for a small town that could be attacked from the internet because they wanted to know what would an attacker do? How would they manipulate the pumps? Um, how would they actually try to break stuff? And the same for the honey train. This was a model train. Nobody knew it was a model train. But it was on the internet. Uh, it was a big story about six or seven weeks ago, I think, because they managed finally to derail it, which for a model train is okay, but in the real world, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> when we're talking about honey stuff, we are talking mostly about decoys and deceptive strategies. And there's an asymmetric relationship between an attacker and the defender because the attacker probably has all the good stuff on their side. And as a, as a defender, we've got a really good advantage that we rarely take use, uh, make use of, and that is we should know our networks better than an attacker <coughs> does. Unfortunately, um, even the boss of the NSA said that uh, the NSA knows networks of companies better than the companies do themselves. <coughs> but let's just assume you know your network and you can tell the decoys from the real machines. The attacker can't until they connect. Um, now that we've talked a lot about traditional honeypots, let's see what else we could do to have these kind of strategies and how we could get results when we are putting honey somewhere else. So how do we get an attacker to actually attack our honey sites or whatever we do? Um, we just have to think like an attacker does. And if we've got a website, we just have the robots.txt and we put something in there like this allows slash b sites my talk dot ppt. And 
I hope you're familiar with a robots.txt that is uh, for the Google spiders and crawlers, <coughs> and it tells uh, a robot where to go and where not to go. If a human looks at this, and somewhere there is disallow slash etc passwd password, the password file, they will go and check it out. And a human attacker might check out those sites that are disallowed. And of course, you monitor those and send an alert if somebody touches that file. A concept I really like is uh, the concept honey people. If you are, well, probably wherever you, you are from, you've heard about the CEO fraud, <laughs> where some social engineers really get people to pay lots and lots of money by just pressurizing them into it. Um, there's a company from the town where I work in Nuremberg who lost 40 million last summer by that. Basically, it, it works like that. The boss calls somebody or writes an email and says, um, I'm in foreign country X and I really need 40 millions now. Please <coughs> hand them over to me. Probably not that easy, but that's the, the gist of it. So if you want to see whether somebody is trying to contact employees at your, uh, at your company, then just create a fake profile or two for those people on Xing or LinkedIn. Uh, use an email address that fits your company and give them a phone number too and forward both to your security team or your security operations center. Because whatever calls at that phone or whatever sends them an email, either somebody who's a really aggressive marketeer or someone who's looking for an easy target for social engineering, you don't really have to update those pages just every now and then. Just don't do a lot of work with them. But make, give them an interesting job position. Not the CEO, obviously. Um, you can get into a lot of trouble for doing that. But some kind of personal assistant, because these are usually the people with the power anyway for social engineers. Put honey in some DNS. So create a few plausible yet unused subdomains, like lab, your site example, or admin, WordPress, whatever you're not using. And this kind of eats the purpose if you allow DNS zone transfer, but I'm assuming you don't. So whenever an attacker is checking out your web page and trying out subdomains that you might not use, they might stumble upon um, a honey DNS page. <laughs> and as soon as your DNS server uh, resolver says, hey, uh, I got a request for lab your site example.org, you can actually send out an alert. And hunting pages, I've briefly touched on that as well. If you have a web page, chances are very great you've got an about page somewhere about HTML. So why not call it about underscore v2 HTML and use that? And of course, you will have an about underscore v1 HTML that you're not using, that is not linked anywhere, but that is one of your honey pages and you alert whenever this is triggered. Because again, an attacker might see your about page that is version two. If I have a look at version one, what are the differences? Who were people on version one that are not on version two? What could I use for social engineering and things like that? So it might give you some insights. Then there's uh, something honey data for database use, where you create a few fake people actually with free email accounts. And you put them together with other made up data in your users databases or wherever, uh, whichever table in your SQL or NoSQL server you can think of. The purpose of these people is just to see whether your database has been breached. Because if anybody ever writes an email to that, or you see the email on page <laughs> or wherever it is uh, leaked, you know somebody has breached your database or somebody's able to read your database. This is something um, with very much of the honey stuff. It might just sit there for years and do nothing. And you can't really know whether it has been breached or not. But if you get a mail to one of those emails, you know that it has been breached. So it might give you that slight advantage. You can put honey in files as well. Um, for example, an interesting file like license.txt lying around on a server where you assume that could be breached from the internet. And whenever somebody touches that file to read it, uh, you just periodically check the access times. I've got the example for <laughs> Linux here. Uh, it's the same on other operating systems. So whenever the access time changes, somebody has read the file and you can send out an alert. And you know this server is compromised. 
we're coming to the concept of honey bitcoins. Um, this is a very interesting con concept. I've read about that uh, some time ago and I thought, oh, that is pretty. You just put a honey bitcoin wallet on your server with a small amount of bitcoin. And whenever that wallet gets stolen or the money gets transferred, you know, hey, this server has been breached. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be even more interesting to put a lot of money in that, uh, say 500 euros or, or a whole Bitcoin? Because as an attacker, if I see something lying around, um, would, I, would I touch a wallet? Well, I, I might if I, um, from previous experience, know that there's really money in it. But then again, there was a company offering that as a service and they went out of business. So I guess the idea is rather shit. <laughs> And to up the paranoia a little bit, if you are a manufacturing company, um, have some honey products. For example, have data sheets for a new product you're putting out this summer. Uh, again, this is not linked by your regular web website. This is just if you have product pages like prod03.html, then just make a prod06 or something like that. And describe your product, but not in detail, and ask the attacker for their credentials if they want to have more information, like an address. I'm pretty sure you feel like winning the lottery if it works out, uh, but it's not far-fetched, because if you've read Cliff Stoll's The Cuckoo's Egg, that's exactly how they captured their attacker, um, by just saying, we've got a new product, and please give us your address if you are interested in it. And one more thing <coughs> that I... Would, put, um, would, would like to cover in Honey are QR codes. So if you're especially paranoid and you think that somebody's digging through your trash wherever you work and looking at all the stuff that you throw away, and just put a QR code in there. And again, this pointing to a Honey website of yours. And so if somebody really goes through your trash, scans that in and goes to that website, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a person of importance um, because they, they are digging through my trash, cool. And you also, of course, know that you are attacked. So the question is, should you put honey on everything? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. But David, you should but, you should yeah. <laughs> Please keep the original goal in mind. Um, as defenders, or generally as people working in the IT industry, we tend to be uh, effective not lazy, and we're looking for ways <coughs> to actually uh, catch an attacker that doesn't cost us a lot of work. So if your honey stuff generates lots and lots of false positives, then it's probably not the correct tool for you, or it will be less useful. If your honey stuff needs a lot of maintenance and doesn't give you any important information, like you've got a honey net set up and nobody's connecting to it, then it's the wrong tool as well. So just find out what works for you and stick to that. Um, there are many more ideas where you could uh, put honey into, uh, so really find out what works for you. There's just one rule I'd like to stress, and that is be creative. Be, don't be too obvious. If uh, the file on your server is called um, luring this kitty or open this for $1,000, somebody might get suspicious, at least if you've got an interesting and intelligent attacker and they might not touch that stuff. So try to make it plausible. Something that could be on that server, and everybody at your company that are on that server should know this is honey stuff, they shouldn't connect to it. And last slide, more or less. Um, is honey a double-edged sword, honey stuff? And of course it is, like everything in IT. Uh, if an attacker knows you're employing honey stuff, they can abuse that. If for example, I was an attacker and I, I knew that there are five honeypots on the network. I could send them tons of alerts because the security operations center would get swamped. Alerts from a honeypot should be, shouldn't be false positives. And so they could uh, trigger their attack somewhere else. The thing is, I think you've missed the point in time where the honey stuff is useful at the point where you missed the attacker who found out about your honey stuff. And also, if an attack is going on and you get tons of alerts on your honeypots, you know an attack is going on. You just ignore the honeypots for that moment and you look for the real culprit. I've put in some links as well. Uh, 
The Waterworks one is German, the rest is mostly English, and I can, can really, I can't figure out that thing, yeah. Uh, the awesome list of honey stuff, there's really more about honey uh, that you can read anywhere else. Uh, the slides will be online, I think, at the B-Sides Munich page and at my page at some point. So, thank you very much for your attention. Um, I think it's time for questions and answers. And I should be very well within my time with it. Yes, you are. So I think there's definitely time for a few <laughs> questions. Thank you so much. I thought it was fascinating. Thank you. So, questions. Yes, yeah, so somebody wants more sweet stuff. <laughs> Some tools that you recommend, Stefan, like uh, um, um, any, any frameworks that are maybe already. Oh, yes. I, I'm not talking about uh, 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 things like network based honeypot, but for creating this, let's say, more abstract, therefore more um, uh, uh, um, um, likely to be related to strategic data in a company, for instance, like, like honey person or honey tokens. Um, it would be interesting to understand is there something like solid that we could use for, for starting with these things? I, in, in the case of honey persons, I don't think so. Um, in case of everything else, uh, you should have a look at the, the things, canary cool. tokens, because that website is really cool. They also sell stuff, but you can get a lot of free honey tokens that you could put somewhere, honey emails, where you know that if uh, that email with, uh, with that token in it ever gets triggered, then you get an alert as well. Um, the downside to this is that much of the info goes back to things. So it's not really something that you have under your own control. Okay. In, in the case of honey people, please also talk to your management. If you give them a new personal assistant, they have no clue about. Uh, <laughs> they tend to get a little bit uh, upset if uh, you fire them on Xing and they didn't even know about them. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I probably should mention that uh, if you're doing that, then also read the license agreement or the, the agreement you have with LinkedIn or saying whether you're allowed to do that and decide whether you care or not. <coughs> Thanks. Questions? You choose. That guy in the back, I've forgotten his name, and I know he's from Israel. <laughs> um, do you have any experience working or, I know for example, Shodan has a system to detect whether the target is a honeypot or not. Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience working around that, or could you talk about it a bit? Uh, yeah, I think um, I probably would choose the easy path and not put a honeypot somewhere where it can be reached from the internet. Because when you're getting scanned from the internet, you're getting false positives. Okay. So if you put honeypots, say, on RFC 1980 networks only, then an attacker will already have breached you and there will be less false positives. Because I think uh, yeah, everything that can be reached reasonably from sites like Shodan or Google or something um, will generate false positives. That's why I meant you shouldn't use sites you link to, just put the HTML pages there. And usually Shodan and Google are not as creative enough to just do what a human attacker would do. Great. So I'd suggest if we um, can continue the discussion in one of the breakout rooms, because we've got a really tight schedule this afternoon. Does everybody know where the breakout rooms are in case they want to continue the discussion with Stefan? It's out of the room here to the right, past the workshop room to the right, and right there. Okay? All right. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks again, again so much.